the leaves of the tree are for you. Shalom, everybody. I just wanted to talk about idolatry and marriage from a different perspective today. And the idea of this video really has its beginnings to a couple of weeks ago when I saw this excerpt from an article on an anti-Paul group on Facebook. I'll leave the link below to the PDF and to the group if you wanted to join it. But basically, I just wanted to read a quick excerpt here. I don't really agree with everything in this PDF. I just sort of was browsing it that day. But I saw something and it was just making me think. I went to look up the verses and it just kind of, I guess, planted a seed in my mind. And then I listened to an Abraham Hicks video recently, which reminded me of this. And so then I thought, well, maybe I'll make a video about it. So I'm going to scroll down to that section, but just so you know, I'll read this off. This writing is an excerpt from Seven Theses Against American Bible-Based Messianic Religions by Melinda Scott from 2013. And so the excerpt is just about Paul, basically. And the reason, you know, that they posted it is basically because it was an anti-Paul group. Um, so basically this section in this PDF is all about what Paul says versus what the Bible says or what Jesus says and you know they just compare the two and so in this section on divorce it says you know Paul says that the sheep must wait for the non-sheep or heathen or idol worshipers or unbelievers to depart in a marriage in order to be free from a marriage covenant 1 Corinthians 7 12 to 15 but the Mashiach said to divorce the idolater, Luke 14, 26. The prophets say to divorce the idolater, Ezra 9, 12 and 10, 11. Malachi 2, 11. The law says to divorce the idolater, Deuteronomy 13, 7 to 12 or 6 to 11 in some versions. And so I'm going to read these verses for you because basically that's what I had to do. I had to look them up and read them and see where they were coming from. And I'm not going to read Paul's... 1 Corinthians, but, you know, Luke and Ezra, Malachi, and Deuteronomy. And so I'm just trying to see what does the Bible say about this stuff. Some of it is connected to sacrifices, and I don't agree with the sacrifices. So then the question comes in, was this even really legitimate writings? You know, we have to have that question. And I don't think that um, the author here is actually saying that any of the Bible could be false, except Paul, um, for, you know, being a false apostle. Although once you realize Paul's a false apostle, then, you know, the rest of the book, the Bible, the book, you know, sort of crumbles because you're like, well, they could just add books at a time. Why couldn't they just add everything? But I already did my video about the foundation of my beliefs and why I believe what I believe. My foundation is very strong now after questioning everything, and I'm all good as far as that goes. But I, again, have a different perspective than the author here. Um, so yes, some of these verses may just have not been true, you know, um, but let's go underneath the premise that they are. So I'm going to read them here, and we'll start with Luke 14, 26, where the author says, the Mashiach said to divorce the idolater. All right, 1426, I would argue he's not actually telling people to divorce, but you can read what you want out of it, I guess, and see that. All right, so Luke 1426, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. I don't see anywhere that he says that you need to divorce your wife in that verse. Um, if that means you should divorce your wife, it also means you should abandon your children and your brothers and sisters and your mother, you know, even if she was, you know, a widow or something. Um, the Bible is very clear as far as taking care of the widows and the children, orphans. You don't, you're not just going to abandon your children or your brothers or sisters or your mother just because, you know, you love Christ more than them. 
if you love Christ more than them, you'll take care of them no matter what they're doing. So I don't see this as a commandment to divorce an idolater out of the Mashiach Christ here. I don't see that at all myself. Um, if you look into the Clementine scriptures, it gets further into what Christ actually was saying when he says to, you know, love him more than the children and everything. But that's not what I'm trying to do in this video. If you ask me, maybe I can leave a comment below with something about that. But for the sake of this video, I'm going to move forward and go to Ezra 9.10. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded by thy servants, the prophets, saying, The land unto which you go to possess it is an unclean land, with the filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations, which have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness. Now therefore, give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace on their wealth forever, that ye may be strong, and eat the good of the land, and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that is come upon us for our evil deeds, and for our great trespass, seeing that thou our God hast punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and hast given us such deliverance as this, should we again break thy commandments, and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Wouldest not thou be angry with us, till thou had, hadst consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? So, Ezra 9, 10 through um, 14 here is very clear. You're not supposed to be co-mingling with the foreigners, those who are practicing evil deeds. They are unclean. They have abominations. They are idolaters. That is true. This verse section here, it's definitely saying not to have anything to do with them. All right, Ez Ezra 10, 10. And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed and have taken foreign or non-Israeli wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore make confession unto Yahweh God of your fathers and do his pleasure and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the foreign wives. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so must we do. So the word for foreign here is not necessarily viewed of as a bad word, you know, to be foreign. They were foreign in different lands. But it has a bad connotation here because they, the foreigners were not worshipping the Israeli god, which means they were worshipping idols or false gods. So yes, Ezra 10, 10 through 12 is definitely suggesting to have absolutely nothing to do with the idol worshippers and to separate yourselves from them. And so I'm going to go forward here to Malachi 2.11. Judah has broken faith. An abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned Yahweh's beloved sanctuary by marrying the daughter of a foreign god. As for the man who does this, may Yahweh cut off from the tents of Jacob everyone who is awake and aware, even if he brings an offering to Yahweh of hosts. So, basically, you know, this person writing is saying that they should be cut off, um, not necessarily Yahweh saying that they should be cut off. And, you know, you can tell it's a curse because he's saying, you know, as for the man who does this, may Yahweh cut him off. It's not saying Yahweh desires people to be cut off. Um, but, yes, they have this view that you are not supposed to be committing idolatry with other people. You're not supposed to be married to somebody else who is an idolater, even if you're not. That's very clear here. All right, Deuteronomy 13, 6. If your very own brother or your son or daughter or the wife you embrace or your closest friend secretly entices you, saying, let us go and worship other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known, the gods of the peoples around you, whether near or far, from one end of the earth to the other, you must not yield to him or listen to him. Show him no pity, and do not spare him or shield him. Instead, you must surely kill him. Your hand must be the first against him to put him to death, and then the hands of all the people. Stone him to death for trying to turn you away from Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. 
Then all Israel will hear and be afraid and will never again do such a wicked thing among you. In the video, What Does the Bible Say About Divorce and Remarriage, linked to below, Brad talks about how the commandment of death to murderers was allowed only because of the hardness of the hearts that murderers had. You know, it wasn't that way from the very beginning of time. There was no death at the beginning of time. There was supposed to be absolutely no killing. In the end, there shall be no more death again. But at this point, when people's hearts are hardened, then they allowed the death of murderers so as to sort of stop the bleeding in some sense. I would imagine it's the same thing here. We aren't to kill, but the stoning is allowed because of the hardness of people's hearts who fall into idolatry. I mean, it's the same exact idea. And so I want to talk about idolatry and relationships in this video, but I wanted to sort of give that as a background. The Old Testament does say to sort of separate yourself from the idolaters and you're not supposed to be taking wives or husbands with those who are into idolatry, worshiping a different God than the nation of Israel did. I don't want to basically reread this whole article. I've already done a video where I do that. Um, but you can check out the article if you haven't seen it before. So this article is, What Does the Bible Mean When It Says Fear the Lord or Fear Yahweh? And it does not mean worry. Basically, really basically, it is the force of the Holy Spirit leading you through your life. And it has, like I said, nothing to do with worry. It's just about being under the influence of Yahweh. And so... What I wanted to point out is this video here, the ancient Hebrew word study for fear. And I would highly suggest watching this video if you have not watched it before. But this is what I want to sort of make the point of. So it says here, there are many things in life which are stronger than we are. Many things which have the capacity to exert influence over us. Things that we characterize as fears. So there's a few things listed here. This is uh, Yahweh or Yahuwah up here on top. But then we also have a fear of pain. So you may not, you know, you might be worried, let's say, of asking somebody out for a date in high school, right? And so you have a fear of emotional pain with rejection. And so in that case, it has an influence over your life and may cause you to not ask that person out, even though you really wanted to go out with them. And the idea here is that Yahweh or Yahuwah is above all of this stuff. So if he wanted you to go out with somebody, you have the choice of this person. You can say, you know, Yes, I'm afraid of rejection, but I feel like Yahweh is leading me. I have a fear of Yahweh. Like, I feel like I'm being pushed by Yahweh to go forward and pursue this relationship. So you have a choice. Are you going to follow that, you know, fear, quote unquote, fear of Yahweh? The idea that he's pushing you towards this person, or are you going to follow that pain, like you're worried about rejection, and so you're not going to ask the person out. So depending on who you choose to follow this pain, you know, fear of rejection, etc., or going forward in spite of those worries, because you feel like you're led by the father to do something, then, you know, that's who you're worshiping. So in this case, it is idolatry to not go forward with the plans that the Father has made in pursuing this person, you know, because you are actually worshiping this pain or fear of rejection as an idol over the Father, because you're being influenced by this fear of rejection more so than the Father. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom because you are no longer controlled by these things. And so when in Matthew, Jesus or Yehoshua, he's telling them, don't worry. Take no heed about what clothes you're going to wear, the resources. Don't worry about what house you're going to live in. 
don't worry about what people think. You know, he told them, don't worry about what you're going to say because the spirit will lead you in that moment when you're supposed to say something. Don't take no heed for the death. You know, if you love Yahweh more than your life itself, he's going to give you life more abundantly. We're not supposed to worry about these things. And so, like I said, read my article for more information about why we're not supposed to worry about what God is talking about either. It's not supposed to be like a cowering in fear. The fear of Yahweh is just going forward, sort of walking through your fear, you know, facing it head on. And I've said this before in other videos, just because I say face your fears doesn't mean like, you know, if you're afraid to stand in the middle of the road because the truck is going to hit you, you're not going to go stand in the middle of the road because you believe Yahweh is going to save you and that truck's not going to hit you. You're only supposed to do things that you feel led to by the Father, even if you feel fear, you know, even if you're worried. So, you know, the Father might be leading you to maybe go on a trip and you might be afraid to fly or something. So you might have a fear of death on an airplane, but the father is leading you to go on that trip. So you know that the father is leading you to do this thing. And if you know that the father is leading you to do this thing that you want to do, but you're afraid of something else, the idolatry comes in when you when you don't do what the father wants you to do. Because... What it is showing is a lack of faith. If the Father wants you to go on a trip, but you're afraid to fly, and you know the Father wants you to go on this trip, then it's a lack of faith that the Father is going to get you to your destination safely. Because you know the Father wants you to go on the trip, and he gets everything he wants. So why are you worried about you know, dying on an airplane if you know the Father is leading you to get to your destination? So... This is the whole point, is we're supposed to, once we know the Father wants us to do this thing, we're supposed to have faith that if the Father wants us to do it, it is already accomplished. Because he gets his will. His word does not go back void. You know, it's going to come to pass. If it's his will, it will happen. And so it's a lack of faith to then think like, well, I'm afraid to die, or I don't have enough money to get that plane trip, you know, or, you know, I can't do this. What will people think about me? You know, we have these fears, but these fears are idols. If we give in to them and we don't have the faith that the father is going to get us to our final destination because he gets his will always. So, when we go forward in faith, that is the quote-unquote fear of Yahweh. That is being led by him and having no idols before him. That's why Jesus or Yehoshua says, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and everything will be granted unto you. Don't worry about what house you're going to live in. Don't worry about where you're going to get your food. It's all going to be provided for you. And if you can step forward in that kind of faith, knowing that it will be, then it will be. And so I just wanted to point this out because there's some people who might not understand how some of what I'm going to talk about is idolatry. And I hope that I've kind of clearly explained here that if you know the Father's plan for something and you're worried about something else, when you're worried about something else, then that is idolatry over the Father because it's not having faith that the Father is going to get his plan done. So when we put something else above the Father, giving us the things we need, because the Father provides everything we need, that is idolatry when we're worried about where that stuff is going to come from. So when, you know, Jesus was talking about, don't worry about where your house is going to come from. Don't worry about how you're going to get food. There's a lot of people who are stuck, quote unquote, stuck of their own making in jobs that they don't like because they're worried about how they're going to provide for their family, how they're going to get food for their family. They may know very well that this is not an enjoyable job for them and it's not the father's will that they just be a slave to this work to pay for money, but 
like they just want this money. They want that for a sense of security. And so I've talked about this previously. I'm going to get to relationships shortly here. But in a different video, I've talked about how I have had jobs where I felt like I need this job to make money. I need this particular job to make money. And the father has sort of basically taken that away from me at various points in my life to show me that I don't need this job to have money. Because to believe that you need this particular job to have money is to be worshiping an idol. So if you have this particular job that you think I need this job and there's no other job that will satisfy me with the resources that I need, that is idol worship. It is saying that there's no other way that the father can provide money and resources for me in my life in a better way. It's showing a lack of faith and it's idolatry. It's looking to that particular job as the source of your income. Now, there's a lot of people out there who do think like, well, this particular job is the source of my income. But it's not. That particular job is the source of an income, but it's not the only income that you are going to get in your life. If you decided to follow the Father and not be afraid of looking for the divine job for you, that the Father really wants you to be doing by divine right, then you would you would be able to find a different source of income because the Father is the one who's providing the income for you. It's not that particular job. Now, the Father may be using that particular job to give you income because you're not allowing anything else into your life right now, but that job is not the source of all income for you forever. You should not think of your job as being the source of income for you. You should think of your job as being one of the sources where income is flowing to you by the father allowing that money to flow to you. If he decided that you should not have that job, you could get fired. And basically, you know, I've gone through just losing a job because the father wanted me to see that that was not actually the divine job for me, that there's something more out there for me. And things have gotten better since then. So what I'm saying is you could think of it as a negative thing if you got fired, but actually in reality, it could be that the father is just trying to move you to the place that is better for you. Your job is not the source of your income. It's just the way the father is giving you income because you won't let him give you income in other ways right now. He is the source of your income. So when you worship your job as the source of your income, you're thinking of it as source. You're thinking of it as God. You're thinking of it as the one who provides you the money so that you can do what you need to do. Rather than actually thinking that Yahweh or who is the one who provides you with the money for what you actually need to do. He uses things to give us money, but he's the actual source. And to think of your job as the source is idolatry. And so I've gone through that and I can see that. So what I want to talk about in this video is relationships. So when we are looking at another person, we may think of them as the source to us for love. There's a lot of people out there who think, you know, if I'm going to be comforted with arms around me or something, it has to come from this particular person or, you know, this particular relationship, whether, you know, you're just dating one person to another and you just think, well, it's my date who, you know, holds me in their arms and I feel comforted with that. So, and you might not get that from your family. Um, but a lot of people out there will think that that person or that relationship in particular is where it is the source of that comfort. And I'm trying to say that that is idolatry. To consider a person or a relationship to be the source of 
let's say anything in a relationship that you're looking for communication maybe you just want somebody to talk to to listen to you a good listener okay so some people think like i need friends because i need somebody who will listen to me when i talk because i need to be heard that is idolatry to consider that you need these people rather than being able to go to the father and feel like he has heard you when you talk and there's people out there who feel like you know like i said with the comforting i need comfort from somebody i want to feel somebody's arms around me or something you know i want to feel that comfort basically it is a feeling of comfort sometimes it's physical manifestations but there's a spiritual or emotional feeling of being comforted that can come and with the law of attraction what you want to look for is the feeling that you're getting and so it doesn't have to be a physical sensation but you could just wrap your arms around yourself too if you wanted to feel that because you know god is inside of you the holy spirit lives inside of you you can comfort yourself the father can use yourself to comfort you um you do not need one other person to be that comfort for you you do not need one other person to be the listener of your issues you do not need one person to do this or that for you though oftentimes we feel like we need that that we are lonely if we don't have that or something so what I'm trying to say is that if you're looking to some other source, some other person, you have turned them into an idol because you're not looking to the true source of comfort. You're not looking to the true source of the listener, the one who loves unconditionally. If you're looking for love in a different person, Abraham would say you're looking for love in all the wrong places. The true love that you are looking for, the true unconditional love that you're looking for is coming from Yahweh, Yahuwah, however you want to say it, who is living inside of you and you don't have to go somewhere to get it. You don't have to get a relationship to feel what you want to feel in a relationship. Law of attraction requires you to feel what you want to feel in a relationship before it will manifest in your life anyway. Everything that you need is inside of you. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And to go after somebody, some relationship in particular, and doesn't just have to be a romantic relationship, um, if, to go after something in particular from some other person is idolatry if you feel like they are your only source of that and you can't get it from Yahweh or Yahuwah, the Holy Spirit inside of you or your inner being, however you want to think of it. So everything you need is inside of you right now. And to feel like you are without, to feel like, you know, if you're not in a relationship with somebody right now or you wish you had more friends or you wish you had parents who loved you and took care of you or something and you were looking for it in somebody else that is idolatry because you're not looking to the true source which is Yahweh or Yahuwah and he's inside of you and loving you all the time and giving you comfort all the time and if you can feel like that then it will manifest in your life and you'll have everything you need. When you realize that the source of everything that you desire is actually already inside of you and you have access to it right now, it opens your life wide open. Like just, you have the possibility to get everything that you want because you it's already there inside of you. The love you're looking for, the unconditional love, you know, if you are looking in all looking for love in all the wrong places, if you're looking to a person to be everything for you, to, you know, be the one who listens to you, to be the one who pampers you, to be the one who can take your anger 
you know, and just absorb it all and not reflect it back to you? If you can't do that for somebody else, what makes you think somebody else is going to be able to do that for you? We all have our moments when we are blindsided by something and we get out of alignment ourselves and we're never going to be that one perfect source of everything ourselves. Now, Christ was, you know, he was one with God like all the time and we're trying and I can say I'm pretty close myself, I think, way better than I was, exponentially better than I was a couple of years ago at being pretty aligned all the time and seeing things the way he sees them because that's what I pray, to see things the way he sees them. But we're never going to be everything to a person. That's not our job. And it's not somebody else's job to be everything for you. So if you're looking to somebody else and saying, you know, I want you to do this, 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 and this, and just like list off all this stuff, and they can't do everything on there, that's idolatry. If you're getting mad at them for not doing that sort of thing, and instead you should be looking to yourself and Yahweh inside because he's the comforter. So like I've said or thought, at least in the past, you know, there was a time when I felt like I had nobody who would listen to me, you know, or could hear me. And I felt like I had nobody I could talk to. But then I felt like, well, you know, I can talk about this with this person. And then there's some other subject and I can't talk about that with that person. So what I realized is, I have a friend who I can talk to about subject A, let's say. And I have a different friend where I can talk about subject B. And I have a different friend where I can talk about subject C. And I don't have to talk about A, B, and C to one person because there's always somebody out there who will want to or be interested in discussing one of these various topics, let's say. So... It's idolatry to try to say that this person has got to listen to me and understand me and see things the way I see them on subject A, B, and C, and D, and all the way to the end of the alphabet and infinity beyond, etc. If you're looking for all of that in one person, that's idolatry. The Father can provide somebody who will listen to you on everything that you want to discuss. However, it's not going to come from the same person. We cannot be everything to somebody but the father can be everything to you and so if you're looking for somebody to you know have comfort from you may find that in you know your friends maybe you don't have a romantic relationship and you want to feel comforted so you go to your friend and you may hug them you know you maybe have a good cry discussing something you hug them you end up leaving with a sense of comfort And if you can just be happy that you have that comfort, then you might manifest a romantic relationship in which you have comfort too. Um, But if you're feeling rather that ingratitude, like, you know, yeah, I got friends, they comfort me, but I still want a lover who comforts me. That ingratitude is going to lead you to the same law of attraction, just you get what you think about whether you like it or not. You know, if you feel like, you know, I can't find a romantic relationship where I feel comforted and you just keep thinking that, well, you're never going to find a romantic relationship in which you feel comforted because those are your patterns of thought. But you can enjoy and be grateful for the comfort you find in your friends and then it may manifest in a romantic relationship also. So we want to be grateful for finding the our needs met, basically, from, you know, one person. But our needs are met in a different way from somebody else. So we don't have to have all of our needs met by one person in particular. We are the body of Christ. The Father is using everybody. And 
everybody can be used by the Father. So somebody may tick off a lot of these things that you're looking for, but maybe not all of them. But that doesn't mean that that's that the person wasn't perfect for that, you know, um, and it would be idolatry to say that the person needs to be perfect in every single way, but rather to accept and be grateful for the things that they are hitting for you, you know, ticking off your checklist or whatever. And then somebody else is going to check off those other, you know, needs or desires of yours. The father is using everybody in your life. So when I said like person A, you can talk to subject A about and person B, you can talk to subject B about and person C, you can talk to subject C about, right? Hold on. The reason I posted that article about uh, the Andy Weir, the egg article or short story is because it is kind of what the Bible says in some ways is that, and it's not exactly the same, but the body of Adam was created and everybody came from the body of Adam. Eve came out of Adam. Eve and Adam's children came out of them. And in reality, we're just all one body of Adam or body of Christ. That is the anointed ones. We all have the Holy Spirit of God inside of us. I've got a video on how we were not born sinners. We are all born children of God. And then some people sort of have their hearts hardened and become a child of Satan or the devil or whatever you want to say. I don't, it's not like a literal thing. Um, and then we're sort of born again back to being a child of God. But at the beginning, we're all created, you know, as the body of Christ. Everybody out there can hear from the Father and can be used by the Father to fulfill what he wants done for a certain person. So, you know, if you are standing here and you feel like, you know, I am going to worship Yahweh above all else. You know, where's my money going to come from? And you just know it's going to come. You just don't know where it's going to come from. Well, somebody might come up to you and donate money or maybe they give you a free uh, free meal or something like that. Um, and so somebody may come up to you. Well, that person is part of the body of Christ. They were moved by the Holy Spirit to be there for you to provide to you. And it didn't have to be a job, you know, it didn't have to be what you thought it had to be. The Father uses people in mysterious ways. We just don't even understand how much he moves people to say certain things. I mean, I'm sure everybody out there has had somebody say something that was like, wow, it's like the Father was just speaking to me through that person and that person had no clue that that's what was going on, you know, uh, the synchronicities of things. Like I was just thinking about this and then I just saw that sign, you know, and the father has ways of using people, moving them, like, I mean, you know, even a license plate, somebody might be, or the backside of a, a truck or some sort of sign on a truck side or something. And you're thinking about something and then you're going along and then you look up and then there's like a sign right there. So the father moved the driver of that truck or car into that particular lane or position. They were stopped at the exact right moment for you to look up and see it. They have no clue that they were a part of the Father's plan. But we're all the body of Christ being used by him to give each other signs and pats on the back and be comfort for each other when we have no idea. I know I've driven and been looking and, you know, I see these numbers now and I was driving and I saw like a parking spot was taken where I normally park. So I parked next to the person and I realized when I got out that the license plate had these numbers that was like a sign to me that like everything's okay. I mean, that person had no idea that that's what they were there for, but the father used that as a comfort to me. The father can comfort you without you ever needing a person to even know that they were a comfort to you. So... I guess my whole point here is that we don't want to look to somebody else to be everything for ourselves because they are not the be all end all that we're looking for. And if we desire somebody to be the, that everything for us, that is idolatry. Um, it's looking for love in all the wrong places. 
the true unconditional love and resources that we need are all inside of us and the Holy Spirit, Yahweh, Yahuwah, however you want to say it. And he can use everybody and everything in this world to provide it to us. What I've said in this video may seem a little strange, but because I know that the verses that I read in the beginning, of course, from the Old Testament were about idol worship and idolatry and actually going after um, other pagan gods, which, you know, you can say the god of Mammon is a pagan god. There's many people who worship money and, you know, we, we see that, but I think that what the idol worship of the past was sort of more literal. It was, it had to be understood. It had to be understood for people who had hard hearts. You know, Jesus didn't come to do away with the law. He didn't come to say that what was written or discussed in the past was wrong from what Yahweh said, although there were some scribal additions to things. But Basically, he wasn't doing away with anything. He was just explaining it from a more spiritual understanding. So in Matthew 5, it says, you know, you have heard it said, don't, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who's looking at another woman to desire has already committed adultery in, you know, with her in his heart. He's not saying that it was wrong. He's explaining this is what was meant. There's a deeper spiritual understanding that people of the past did not understand. They took it very literal and they couldn't see, you know, it couldn't, it's not just about going forth and doing the act that people can tell. All the commandments, except for lust, are things that you can see. And I've discussed, of course, with the Clementine homilies 8, that the lust is actually just a representation of ungratefulness, thinking that you aren't being provided what you're looking after. Like if you're lusting after another woman or if you're lusting, um, wanting somebody dead, you know, like you're lusting for bloodshed or whatever, it's, it's a sign in your heart that you're not grateful for what you do have. It's ungratefulness at the very core. And Clementine Homilies 8 talks about ungratefulness being the fall of mankind, which again goes with the law of attraction, as I've stated before. I have an article on my website about that. Um, I believe that's the, you know, I'm free from being a slave, etc. article. But basically, everything in the Ten Commandments, except for lust, was easily seen by people. You know, don't kill somebody. Don't steal something. Don't, you know, look after don't want, you know, somebody's wife and commit adultery with her. But it's the lust that's the heart of it, the heart of the matter. And they did not understand that. They were very clear cut. They wanted something that they could see and judge themselves. But it's so much more than that. What If, if something is being seen, as in somebody stole some money or somebody killed somebody, that's that means that there was a seed of the devil planted inside of them rather than the seed of God, the seed of Satan, serpent seed, however you want to see it, was planted inside of that person a long time ago. The seed of ungratefulness, the seed of feeling like they have something I want and I don't want them to even live anymore because they've got it and I don't and I'm really mad at them. Or they did this to me and I'm not going to be forgiving, so I'm going to want them dead, you know. Um... There's a seed that's been planted in that person. And once it comes forth as a manifestation that's physical, that people can point out and say, wow, that person was really bad for doing that, as in breaking the commandments, it means that that bad seed has germinated for quite some time before it came to that point. And that's the whole point when Jesus is telling them that, you know, it's not what goes into you that's defiling you, you know, it's the heart of the matter. It's the spirit inside that is the defilement. That's what comes forth. If you're clean on the inside, you'll be clean on the outside too. If you're dirty on the inside, it doesn't matter how much you try to wash yourself off on the outside, it's going to come out of your mouth in the future. And it's going to come forth as a manifestation. The fruit of that tree will come forth. 
you know, are you a wheat or a tear? Is it coming forth as in good fruit that will save people or bad fruit that will kill people? So it, it's all the Ten Commandments, t- telling people to judge other people on the Ten Commandments is like way late, way late manifestations. If you want to judge yourself by the Ten Commandments, you have to judge your heart. That's, you know, if you're lusting after somebody, if you're ungrateful, that's where the problem comes in. And there's a lot of people ungrateful. And you can do this for yourself and just take, you know, a day or a week or something and just try to think about it. Don't complain. If you think that you are going to complain like, oh man, this traffic is so bad. Oh man, that person just, you know, cut ahead of me, you know, how rude, Um, you know, or complaining, man, I didn't get paid that much for this, you know, or I could have done better. I could have sold it for way more than that. But this is all I got, you know, Um, I could have had this, but I got that. If you're ungrateful for the things that have happened in your life, that is a sign that you're not right with God. We're supposed to be thankful for everything. And bless, you know, love your enemies. Um, Pray for them. Don't go around cursing them because, well, they're just another part of you. They're a mirror of you, etc. But also, we're supposed to treat everybody as we would treat Christ. And if somebody is doing something that's negative, it probably means that they went through a lot of stuff before they got to that point of doing that. They can be either completely unaware, spiritually blind... They have their reasons, and we have our reasons, and we haven't been perfect either. So if you want grace, you have to give grace. If you want to be forgiven, you have to forgive. So we need to judge the commandments by ourselves, And really, it all comes down to being grateful, I think. And that's what we need to focus on ourselves. But my whole point here is basically that Christ was not saying that the laws of adultery were wrong, He was saying that, you know, if you're looking on somebody and desiring her, it's in your heart that you've already started it. That seed was already planted when you were lusting. And if it comes out to be bad fruit, you know, you knew what you were planting in that moment. You know, pay attention to what seeds you're planting. If you are complaining about something, you're planting a seed of unforgiveness, of ungratefulness. You know, we have to be careful about what seeds we're planting in our own mind, in our own body, in our own spirit. So just like take a day or a week or something and say like, I'm not going to complain. And then you'll start to notice all the things that your spirit wants to complain about. And just take a good look at yourself. Um, But that's not really the point of what I'm trying to say here, but it is a good thing to do. My point here is that What I'm talking about, my version that I'm discussing of idolatry, I'm not saying like I'm just making this up out of nowhere, but that when they talked about don't marry somebody who is from another land where they practice idolatry, that that was, they were very physical. You know, they could see that they were worshiping idols. But sometimes you have to take a step back and look at, your relationships with your friends or your romantic relationships. And you have to look at the person and say like, are they worshiping idols? Are they looking for love in all the wrong places? Are they upset at me? Like to say like, is this person upset at me for doing this, that or whatever? when they should really be looking at themselves and their relationship with the father. Because sometimes a person may want, you know, X, Y, Z, and you can't give them X, Y, Z. And, you know, maybe they are sort of worshiping you as an idol, like looking for everything in you to be their source instead of going to the father themselves. So now I'm not saying, you know, just go ahead and divorce somebody if somebody else is doing this. Like if they're trying to get you to be 
their source instead of actually having them go to the father. But it's just something that's an interesting belief, I guess. I don't know. Interesting perspective um, to think about that, you know, there was a relationship I had where, you know, I could say that he was an idolater for, you know, believing in the Trinity or something like that, you know. Um, And I know that the Trinity leads to the belief through the whole atonement theory that Jesus died for us that we don't have to stop sinning ourselves. And I can see the physical manifestations of that belief, that idolatry in the Trinity actually can lead to a belief that we're atoned for and we can sin and it doesn't matter what we do because we're still saved and so it's okay to live a life of sin. And through that, I could be led into doing things that I would not normally do because I felt like, oh, we're just sinners and it doesn't matter what we do in this life because stuff will happen in the future life and we're all taken care of already. It's already been done. And it's it's a it's got bad fruit. And you know, you can say that once it gets to that point, like, you know, you should not be with somebody who worships idols. But you know, it may go beyond that. There may be you know, sometimes when you have to take a break and just see that, you know, it was something even more than that. That I felt, you know, in some ways that I felt like I had to do X, Y, Z to, you know, keep a relationship. And we are not supposed to ever have to go forward and try to be that person that somebody else wants. We're supposed to be true to ourselves. And so there is a point when if you feel like you are doing stuff just to please the other person, that you are actually just sort of, I mean, there's all codependencies and all that sort of thing where you just keep, you know, moving the person along and doing something that's dangerous to themselves, etc. Um, So we don't want to try to be the source for other people either. We have to understand sometimes that we can't be everything to other people. And so I'm just saying that there's a different perspective here that we need to understand in the idol worship in relationships, that it's not always about... It's not always about worshiping these pagan idols that people think it is. I think people who think that it's about, you know, like, oh, this person worships the Trinity or they worship Baal, they're practicing Easter or Christmas or something. And then that's like worthy of me divorcing them or something. It's not always about that as like a physical manifestation. And I can see people who, you know, continue to practice these holidays and they've got more of a spirit of Christ loving others and being kind to each other than some in the Hebrew Roots Movement do. And so I don't think that it is about those physical idols that people try to make it so literal. I think it really does come down to if somebody is trying to get what they want from another person instead of getting it from God, that's the idolatry that it's sort of talking about. And that's why Jesus says, you know, if you love your wife or your parents or whatever more than me, that's idolatry. And that is idolatry. That doesn't mean you have to divorce the person because you can love Christ more than them and still love them and pray for them like you love your enemies and stuff. Like, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to divorce somebody. But I think that when the Bible does talk about divorcing over those who are practicing idolatry, that if somebody, if you're in a relationship with somebody and they are wanting you to be 
XYZ and you are not XYZ, you're not their end all be all, you could try to change yourself to be that, but that would be idolizing them over Christ because you're not being true to yourself and who you truly are as a child of God. So you need to be true to yourself, following the Father more than them. And sometimes when you decide to follow the Father more than the other person and start doing what the Father wants you to do, His will, the other person might not like you so much. And if that's the case, then divorce is okay, I believe, because you're following the Father more than them, and if they're not okay with that, then they're worshiping idols. If they're not okay with you being who the Father wanted you to be, then they're looking for love in all the wrong places. They're looking for you to be their end-all, be-all, instead of going to God for that, which means they've idolized you. And, you know, in a situation like that, that person may be looking at you and thinking, you know, if you told them, like, hey, you're idolizing me over God, and they would be like, you're crazy. I'm pretty pissed off at you right now because you're not doing X, Y, Z. They're not going to feel like they're idolizing you. But if they're looking for love, X, Y, Z, out of you and you can't give it, why aren't they looking to God for that? Why aren't they looking for that fulfillment through him, which everything comes from? It's because they're looking for a different God. They're idolizing you. And so I wanted to talk about this verse in divorce. Now, like I said, you can see Brad's video on divorce and remarriage for way more information on this. Um, but in Matthew 5, 31, it says, And it was said that whoever may put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorce. But I, I say to you that whoever may put away his wife, save for the matter of whoredom, doth make her to commit adultery. And whoever may marry her, who hath been put away doth commit adultery. Now, of course, um, Brad was saying that it's talking about being put away without a divorce certificate, and that's why they'd be an adulteress. That's his video. I'm not going to get into that point here, but my point is the matter of whoredom. It says, whoever may put away his wife save for the matter of whoredom. And so what I wanted to look at, the one thing that Jesus is saying here is okay for, you know, putting away a wife without a bill of divorce and all that sort of stuff is whoredom. And the word for whoredom here is also used for fornication or idolatry. It's pornea. It's where we get the English words pornography and pornographic from. Um, to sell off or selling off or surrendering of sexual purity, promiscuity of any or every type. But I just wanted to focus on the idolatry portion because basically he's saying that, you know, for the matter of idolatry it's okay to put away a woman without a divorce certificate because we're told to not engage in, you know, relationships with those who are idolaters. And that's why I wanted to focus on what is idol worship in relationships because it's a bit more than what we usually think of, I think. And that's what this video is about. Um, so here when it talks about idols, I'm just going to read this part portion here. Um, in accordance with a form of speech common in the Old Testament and among the Jews, which represents the close relationship between Jehovah, Yahweh, Yahuwah, and his people under the figure of a marriage. So it's used metaphorically of the worship of idols in like Revelation 14, 8, Revelation 17, 2, etc. I can leave this page um, if you want to check that out. But here um, it says of idolaters. But in John, the passage cited others understand physical descent to be spoken of, of the defilement of idolatry as incurred by eating the sacrifices offered to all idols and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, so basically it can be about idolatry as in the relationship of between you and Yahweh when you are not seeking Yahweh for your source of everything, you are worshiping idols. And that is the 
sexual impurity. That's where the fornication comes from because it's a relationship between you and the father and you are fornicating away from the father when you are looking for love in all the wrong places, trying to get XYZ out of somebody else who cannot provide XYZ when you should be looking to it for like from the father instead of that person. So this video is not to suggest that you should be divorcing somebody over whatever. I just wanted to give a different perspective. It's just something I've been thinking about. And like I said, there were just things that I was led to different videos like Abraham Hicks. I'll leave some videos below too about that. And I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching and shalom. Chris White once coined the phrase short-term New World Order Freakout Syndrome to explain what it's like to have your perception of the world shattered. Of course, it's not just about the shape of the world, whether it's flat, round, or something else entirely. This New World Order freakout often includes now saying no to GMOs, fluoride, vaccines, and pharmaceuticals. It's a complete overhaul to your lifestyle. And trying to explain that mainstream media is just propaganda to promote false flags, division, and more can really put a strain on your relationships. Have you gotten tired of being mocked by your own family for what you share? We've all been there. Are you treated like the black sheep because of the commandments you keep? I get it. We're all trying to figure things out together, but sometimes you just have to let your family and friends be. Plant the seed and wait and see. But while you wait for them to catch up, do you wish you had someone to talk with who gets it? That's what Truth or Talk is for. Being able to discuss what's going on in your life and what you're interested in without feeling like you're going to be judged as a crazy conspiracy theorist who should be on drugs or committed. No subject is taboo, and I'd love to hear from you. Simply truthertalk.com. Simply make an appointment, and let's talk, truther. Believe in truth.